And they didn't come in until like five afternoons so Yeah, was exactly. Late. Exactly. They were late, so we'll wait. Yeah. This is where okay. She's new. She is. So uh, why don't I allow her in and then I'll say we're just gonna wait for others. Great. Hi Stephanie, are you there? Anyway. Stephanie, can you hear us? Hmm. Hmm. Stephanie, we can't hear you. Good. No. Are you there? Stephanie is muted. Stephanie, can you hear us? Oh, I can hear you. Let's see. Huh. There's only one speaker that it can be coming out of. We can. Uh... Oh, Barb got off. Barb got off. Hmm. Stephanie, right. can, can you try speaking? Is it allowing you to? Hi, Barb, how you doing? Hi, I'm good. Good, okay, we're gonna wait for a few others before we get things started. Stephanie, I'm so sorry, we are unable to hear you. I'm not sure if you're able to work with your mic. It shows I'm unmuted. Huh. Switch to my phone. Hello, are you able to hear me now? Trial version. Yes. All right. Much Stephanie, better. We can definitely hear you. Okay. okay. Great. Now we're just going to put things live and then we'll get going. Just one moment. She was a recent person on Lighting Networks. Okay, you should be good right. to start. Okay, so Barb and Lynn and Stephanie, um, can you all hear me? Yes. Yes. Lovely. Yes. Lovely. Well, I think that we're just going to start and people will join as things come on. So Stephanie, I think you are probably the newest person that I haven't seen before. Um, so I would love to know from you one one success that you've had, things that are something that's worked really well and a ch current challenge that you're having. Oh gosh, well, something new for me this year is the Jack B. Little Pumpkins and those are going crazy. I never would have expected uh, uh, so much. <laughs> So that's going well. Um, and one challenge I'm having is my potatoes that I was growing in a container. Um, I've grown them in the ground before and had success, but this year I tried in a container and they never flowered and I just pulled them. And I got some that were very small, like the size of a quarter, um, but definitely not like a harvest I was hoping for. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, Potatoes can be a challenge. Now, I think one of the things that we're seeing this year with a lot of crops is the challenge of extreme heat. And although potatoes are a member of the tomato family, they prefer it when you plant them to have their roots cool or the tubers cool, about two weeks germination, and then you grow them like tomatoes. What I think we may forget to do when we're growing in containers is to keep mulching them. If you don't mulch them, then the potatoes, when the plants flower, if they do, are produced on top of the ground. So I'm wondering if the milieu that you were growing them in, in that, in a container was just not enough. A couple of years ago, I grew potatoes with, um, with my son and a couple of my grandkids in a couple of deep recycling containers. 
And the kids had wonderful fun consistently putting straw around it for mulch. They also do require consistent moisture. So those are just a few suggestions for you with growing potatoes in containers. They, are, they need to be consistently mulched so you have no more than about nine or 10 inches of stem above the soil, consistently moist uh, soil. Do medium. potatoes have to flower to have tubers? That's something I they, haven't been able to they find. They do, they do. The flower, usually what happens during the cycle is the flower is produced and then the vine starts to die down. And as soon as the first flowers start to fade, normally we can push back some of that mulch or some of the soil and harvest a few baby potatoes. The vine does need, in order to get full growth of the potatoes though, the vine does need to die back. And I will say that probably of Almost any vegetable, potatoes have got the most ability to transmit diseases. So any diseases that tomatoes get, potatoes get threefold, especially the blight diseases. Hey, thank you. You bet. Um, Lynn, let's check in with you. Give me an Hello? update this week. Hello. Hi, I'm here. Hello. Oh, Good. Okay. Um, everything's done you know, well in the garden that I planted, everything is growing and everything. And I know last time um, you had your webinar, I did mention that the Silver Queen corn was way ahead of season. And now it's, it's silked up and, you know, tousled. I mean, it's, it's har I'm harvesting it. It's done I'm, for the season. Yeah, I, I know. That. Big change. A big change, yes, yes. Yay. Yay. Well, um, but, but I did get some harvest, so I am um, drying some of them and saving for seeds for next year. I hope that'll work because um, I don't want to buy the seeds again or the plants. <laughs> I want to use my own. Do you think it's going to work? I think, you know, Silver Queen is an heirloom variety. It's an old fashioned variety. Um, and as long as those seeds are nice and dry and you store them cool and dry, uh, right. I think it's wonderful to save your oh. own from the best plants that you have. Okay. I, do that. I do that every year with my heirloom peppers and tomatoes. Okay, well, that's, that's <laughs> what I'm doing with that. Now, my, my issue that I've had kind of ongoing for, well, probably the whole season is I have a pesky black mouse that has decided it, it lives in, in my plot. Um, doesn't live out in the flower garden surrounding. It, it burrows and does holes. And I, I put little mouse pellets in and, you know, fill the hole and put stones over. And um, I really um, find new holes every morning. <laughs> Any suggestions other than using, putting wire mesh down the inside between the dirt and the wood frame? <laughs> you know, Lynn, I think that you could teach this. That's exactly what I would recommend. There is no easy way for burrowing rodents. You know, it's just to, again, this season, it's probably too late, but next season, go ahead and do that mesh underneath where you find you might even try, I don't know if it's, uh, it might even work, but just some hot, hot pepper sprays. Okay. Um, capsaicin that you might try down the hole. I know okay. some people with squirrels and bird feeders have had some results with okay. putting capsaicin hot peppers in. And okay. just thinking that this might have some of uh, a deterrent effect of anything else, if nothing else. So capsaicin, for those of you who don't know, is the chemical compound um, that's contained in hot peppers with um, things like jalapenos, serranos, and then the real hot ones, um, habaneros being higher on the scale of uh, the amount of capsaicin. So the hotter the pepper with the seeds, you might try burying them and see if that makes their um, entryway a little bit less um, attractive. And again, the mesh is about the only thing. All right. Well, Sorry. No, that, 
that's okay because I actually put up 24 inch uh, high, you know, fence around the plot, you know, with the green metal posts and everything. Um, mm -hmm. And this, this year, I decided to deter, you know, any rabbits that are coming into the garden. So I put 12 mm -hmm. inches of the half inch mesh, you know, I cable tied it around, you know, so that bottom portion, there was no entry. Well, of course, that's fine. There's been no rabbits in the garden, just the mouse that just oh. comes up under the ground, <laughs> burrows under the planks. So, <laughs> you know, you, you can you can join some of our other um, gardens that have got resident foxes that, that burrow and oh. raccoons. So, you know, the more that, the more Those that we, you know, you think Those about bigger <laughs> holes, you, know, you think about mice, um, the more that they have a, a source of, of ready food, you know, right. to make sure that you're harvesting, you know, a preferred thing like squash and tomatoes, you're harvesting those on a regular basis. You might even yes. put cages and mesh around them um, oh. to, to keep them off of the fruit itself. Um, <laughs> okay. I, re I remember, you know, this is going back the year that I, that I was smart enough to say, you know, Judy, you know, you really shouldn't have to really pool in Denver. But at that point, I had installed a backyard water lily pool, which was lovely. And I had just some goldfish in with the water lilies until the raccoons said, oh, this is a source of free food. And my, my, my children at that time were young. And I remember Tony came out, who's now got, you know, two kids of his own and said, mom, there's this huge blue bird. So I attracted you know, egrets, blue <laughs> egrets here in Colorado, raccoons, foxes. <laughs> and at that point I said, you know, I, do, I think I need to let botanic gardens do that source of water, extra water, and I'm not providing the free food. So oh my gosh. Uh, of course, by the, by the time I realized that the goldfish that I was not feeding were eating the algae and they were becoming like koi. They were huge and multiplying like crazy. So I decided there are some things I do and some things <laughs> I don't. So you know, keeping a cage, I have started to, to cage, put cages around all my tomato plants with meshes to try and keep the grasshoppers out. So let me pose this problem. Mm -hmm. Is anybody having an infestation of grasshoppers? Yes. Ah, I'm <laughs> hearing a yes. That's Lynn. Lynn yeah. says yes. Grasshoppers and crickets. <laughs> ah, yeah. So with climate change, the extreme heat that we've had, I was really hopeful this year because they did not emerge until end of June, which is almost a month later than they had emerged last year. Last year, they took down my yarrow, native oh. perennial. Nothing, nothing takes down yarrow. A, a patchy plume, another dryland shrub, doesn't, doesn't do that. Um, and um, it, it was pretty interesting uh, to notice what their favorite things were. They didn't take any of the, uh, I have a whole mass of purple cone flowers. They didn't take the echinacea or, but any of the grasses and I have tall grasses. So I said, okay, so they're not out this year. And all of a sudden, last of June, they were out in full force and they decimated peppers where they could come in from the alley. Pretty interesting watching their entryway. Huh. So they would come in from the alley, from the, the margins of the property. The beds that were further away from the alley, there was less damage, but peppers, extensive damage on tall grasses. Wow. Um, the clematis, they took down the clematis, completely ground level. Broadleaf plants, other than coneflowers, they took down. They are now moving into the tomato fruit. Mm -hmm. And I can see. So do, uh, I mentioned that because do watch the fruit of tomatoes and anything with grasshoppers. Um, yes. And you might want to, you might want to, um, um, I've started using with some, I'm going to hold it up again, Arbico Organics. This is a commercial garlic product called Garlic Barrier. Grasshoppers do not like the scent of 
garlic. Okay. So at this time of the year, it's too early when they're in the adult stage to think about anything that you would do in the fall. But at this time, um, let's go ahead and, and spray with garlic. And if you don't, and again, that, this is from Arbico Organics, my favorite catalog, A-R-B-I-C-O hyphen organics.com. I'm sure that Rachel will put that in the chat. Um, it is great for any of these esoteric products that I'm going to mention. So it's a great general repellent. And I would do that every couple of days. The other thing that I would do that I'm finding great satisfaction in doing, and it might sound gross, is um, the first thing in the morning, I do this several times a day, I take out my best scissors that have got a sharp point. <laughs> you know what I'm going to say. Uh -huh. and, and, and quickly zoom in and cut their heads off. Uh -huh. okay? It's very satisfying. <laughs> <laughs> what I've found is if you just cut the back legs off or whatever, or you injure them, they're still hopping. And I'm sure they would get injured. So if you cut the heads off, you can then step on them. And I have no doubt that at least I am limiting, possibly, I'm possibly limiting their ability. Uh, essentially, I'm, I'm, I give myself points when I can find a breeding pair because okay. they are breeding at this time of the year. So that's two for one. Okay. Uh -huh. And if you think that grasshoppers have got the potential to each lay upwards of 80 eggs a piece, think wow. about what you're doing for birth control for next year, okay? Yes. They will be back. <laughs> but all the estimations are that this is an ongoing problem. They are sticking around later on in the year. They're breeding longer and the eggs are more viable. So in the fall, we'll talk about this next time go to Arbico Organics, you can get beneficial nematodes. Right. To spray in on for the eggs, but it's too early for that. So. I think, they're, I think they're bigger this year too. I, I actually, I, yeah. I, I actually am using the same, you know, Dollar Tree, you know, kids butterfly net to ah. now swoop them just like I was swooping the Japanese beetles. And Love it. Dumping them just like I did with the jet beetles into a lidded plastic jar that has Dawn dish liquid. Yeah. So I'm, I'm Dawn dish liquid is just wonderful for drowning yep. it. Yeah. But I love, I love the reminder of using a net for catching. Well, they're faster than I am. <laughs> and I need yes, a little abs term. Absolutely so. And absolutely I think, so. and as I said, I think they're really, truly, they're big. <laughs> oh, they're huge. Yes, they're absolutely huge. So, Barb, let's let's talk with you. What's what's uh, what's going on with you this week? Um, so, I have a question on the composting because it seems like it's just a, every fall we have to build our compost over again because we can't get people to. Well, it just doesn't work out where you can layer in the browns and greens throughout the growing season. So we end up, you know, just having one bin. The third bin has just a pile of. Vegeta you know, vegetation, and then the middle bin has our compost that we made last year. So which, so, which, garden, which garden are you in? Oh, I'm at the George Washington School and Community I, Garden, oh, and we have a three bin compost. Yeah, we all have that, okay. Yeah, so right now I'm transferring the, the stuff that's good compost into the, the outside bin so that we can build our working compost in that middle bin, but um, I guess there's no other way except to just in the fall, we just use a lawnmower and chop things up and layer it in with the alfalfa and get it working. But yeah, I wish, I wish there were an easier way for community gardens. It's a lot easier for the home gardener when there's one or two people managing the system, but without explicit instructions. And especially um, we are really trying to get signage out to all of our community gardens that not only describes the process, but also includes please chop material up, do not include insect or disease laden material. And also we recommend no tomato plants at all. So if, if you could put that before we get signs out, that information out to GW, please do not put tomato plants in. The um, alternary of blight, the early blight is, is pretty rampant. There's also some viral diseases going on with tomatoes. 
Um, and a lot of that stuff, including the disease material that I'll talk about shortly on squash and cucumbers, does not belong in a compost pile. So, you know, real quick, quick sign is that you could help us with, was please do not put any tomato plants in. Nothing that has overt signs that's, sh that's shown any wilting um, or has blotches or spots or looks deformed or has got a lot of insects on it and no tomatoes at all. That would be really helpful. Okay, yeah. All right, but I but I hear you. It's a lot more more difficult in a community garden, um, right? I mean, have... I'm even I'm guilty yeah. of not chopping things up when you just get a lot. You're pulling out a lot, and you just run out of time. And I yeah, don't. let me let me ask you this: Is there a possibility that uh, somebody in the garden might don't? Do you have a storage, a fairly good sized storage shed? Yeah, and we do have, uh, Lisa donated her lawnmower, so we have good. that. So you're using the lawnmower? Okay. Yeah. Great. Good. Yeah. Um, I wish I had some instant tips otherwise, um, other than that, um, but you're doing everything right, and we will get signage out as soon as possible. Do you, um, is there, in addition to you and Lisa, are there other people on a compost committee? Um, no, we haven't been very organized, so we've had trouble even getting people to come to like a potluck dinner or yeah. you know work days it's just I think people are busy and it's been weird after COVID and all but it's been weird after COVID it's been 95 degrees starting the season <laughs> with 100 degrees in June is not real conducive to keeping that energy level up I think yeah yeah okay. yeah all right. Well, well. Thanks for everything you're doing, sure. and and um, keep me posted on what happens with that additional information. My other it. question was about um, I have a lot of flowers on my cucumber plant, but I don't have many vegetables. Is there a way to get more <laughs> to get more production? You know, this is this is a question um, we're getting. The cukes are late, and again. Just a reiteration for people who may not be aware that squash, cucumbers, um, melons, any of that, any of those veggies in the cucurbit family have got male and female blossoms on the same plant. All right. Male blossoms are produced prolifically. They fall off after one day if the female blossoms are not open at the same time for pollination. So my, my guess would be that you've got a whole bunch of male blossoms that are looking for love and there's no, um, there's no uh, opportunity available within the day. So they're dropping off and they're getting no fruit. Mm -hmm. The other thing that's happening and we're seeing it on tomatoes is um, the pollen that is produced when the weather is extremely hot is not as sticky. So the pollination that goes on sometimes at this time of the year, even when you get pollination with a female flower, what you get is incomplete pollination, especially towards the end of the season. So you get these weird shapes on cukes and squash and you see it at the end of the season. You also see it at the beginning of the season. So be patient, make sure that you are not fertilizing with a high nitrogen fertilizer, which is gonna produce more, uh, more leaves. You don't want mm -hmm. that. You might want to try a drench with um, kelp, liquid kelp seaweed which would give you some micronutrients and check what's happening with powdery mildew too, which after I talk to Julie, I will address. So um, let's wait on that until I talk to Julie. Julie, can you unmute? I am listening, thank you, first of all, but I am listening today. I am um, on carpool duty. So I'm just going to focus on that, <laughs> but I'm gleaning information. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, let me address, um, I'm going to just hold something up. I just did a short video um, and hopefully this comes up at the screen. Can everybody, let me see, maybe this way. Can everybody see this on the zucchini leaf? Yes. Okay. That's powdery mildew, but what I wa also want to show you, let me see if I still have this, is, yeah, this is really sturdy. The normal, the normal coloration before the powdery mildew, that's the normal variation in color on the squash variety, okay? Do not confuse powdery mildew, which is this white talcum-like. 
thing further on down on the leaf. Let me turn over leaf and see if I can show you some on the back. No, but at this time of the year, um, all of our cucurbit family, summer squashes, winter squashes, cucumbers, melons, pumpkins, are all coming down with powdery mildew. It happens as the plants enter senescence, which is they're getting older. Um, this is a fungal disease and it is host specific. There are so many plants that get powdery mildew. Um, the squash family gets it. If there still happen to be any old pea vines in the garden, they get it. Um, ornamental wise at home, the lilacs are covered with powdery mildew. So this is a widespread problem. Um, you never see it at the beginning of the year when the plants are nice and vigorous. It can be controlled at this time when you first see it. So I would ask everybody to go out and really look carefully at what's happening to your squash plants. So it starts um, on the older leaves. It is spread in dry, hot weather that we're having now. It's also spread right before a storm when the humidity increases. So plants, if you think about a squash plant, it's just packed. There's really no way of, you know, unless we're out thinning leaves all the time, we talk about spacing plants. Obviously you want to squat, space your large squash plants to be three or four feet apart, but inside that plant itself, the foliage is packed. So that being said, packed conditions that cut down aeration help to spread this. Overhead watering on any hairy leaf plant needs to be stopped. You water at the base of the plant. So um, a couple, couple of recommendations. You need to, at this time of the year, at the first sign of this, prune off not just the leaves, but the leaf stem called the, the petiole. Take a pruner, cut it off where it attaches at ground level. Make sure that you have straw at the base of the plant just the way you do hopefully at the base of your tomato plants. What else can I tell you? There are a couple of controls. Uh, also those leaves that you prune off will spread disease or have a potential to spread disease over winter fungal spores. If you put them in the compost pile, dispose of them. No powdery mildew leaves in a compost pile. I'm gonna hold up a, um, uh, okay. I'm gonna hold up again, Arbico Organics. This is potassium bicarbonate, okay? If you get that from Arbico Organics, it's four teaspoons of potassium bicarbonate for two gallons of water that you spray until runoff. Put it in a gallon sprayer. There's another homemade thing that you can do. Regular baking soda is very similar to potassium bicarbonate. One tablespoon of regular baking soda, two and a half, half tablespoons of some type of oil. I prefer to use one of the horticultural oils, a product such as Sunspray, S-U-N-S-P-R-A-Y. In a pinch, you could use canola oil. So one tablespoon of baking soda, two and a half tablespoons of oil per gallon of water, okay? That's after you remove this. Either potassium bicarbonate, or the homemade baking soda at seven to 10 day intervals. It's not a one day type thing. So you will notice that if you are assiduous about removing the leaves and next year consider two plantings of summer squash, just a few seeds, one seed or so at month intervals. My latest planting that I did, which was the 1st of July, one seed at this point does not have powdery mildew. So there is definitely a connection between the health, the young plants, and at least coming down at later points. So this will give you squash when you didn't think, could I have one more zucchini? Believe me, you will. They are, as I mentioned prior, we're gonna be seeing incomplete pollination. We've got powdery mildew, which cuts down the health of the leaves for, for leaf production and food production. So there will be a time in September when you're, when you're gonna say, I really miss those zucchini. So in addition, if, I know you don't believe me. In addition, make sure that you're harvesting several times a week. I am still looking at four feet zucchini in gardens, 
And again, these are stress plants. So whatever you can do, a kelp drench at the bottom, not fertilizing to produce new leaves. So no high nitrogen fertilizer, pruning off those leaves and leaf stem, some type of baking soda or bicarbonate um, in a pinch. The other thing, a little bit higher up that you can try neem oil extract. And I'd like to see that you use the bicarbonate first. This does not substitute for pruning off that diseased leaf. The other thing that you can use is another safer product, which is basically garden sulfur. This is safer garden fungicide for powdery mildew. So let's be aware that this is one of the main things that's happening at this time of the year and is only gonna get worse. So I will say that. Um, so what do you well, do with the baking soda? So you spray it on the leaves, okay? It, it's okay. one tablespoon baking soda, two and a half tablespoons of some type of oil per one gallon of water. You spray it on the leaves until it, you see it drenched, until it's falling off. That's the top and the underneath sides. Okay. You know, if you let it, if you let it get to the point where the leaves drop off and they will, they'll just die. This thing can be spread year to year where the spores just germinate and overwinter. And that's the reason for not just throwing the leaves in the compost pile. Okay. So just know that that treasure is coming up now. Let me talk to anybody at this time of the year. Um, if you have done any soil renewal or thinking about a fall garden, what are you guys doing for that? Any plans? Nobody? This is this is Stephanie. Um, for my, um, I guess soil renewal over the fall and winter. I have a cover crop to plant of winter rye, and then a mixture of the clover, oats, and peas. Great, love it, love it. And for those of you who might not be aware of it, can you describe why you are doing that? So I have noticed a big difference in my soil health um, doing that to a year that I just covered with straw. It really added a lot back into the health of the soil. And honestly, it was just great to see my bed covered in green growing plants um, in the middle of winter. <laughs> Isn't that exciting? I think it's wonderful. <laughs> That's fabulous. So that um, for those of you who might not be, uh, you know, have, or might have not have done that before. It's a great way of, it's actually called green manuring. So we think about animal manure, but this is, this produces copious quantities of green material that you can then dig into your soil. If you're using a crop like oats or, or hairy vetch, um, they will then provide additional sources of compounds that are given off from the roots that feed the soil micro, microorganisms. So really what we're doing is we're covering the soil, we're breaking up the tightly packed clay particles. So we're increasing, we're changing the soil structure, the way the particles are put together that allows water to penetrate um, and also increasing the organic material in the soil. So it's a win-win situation. We're not allowing soil erosion with the winds and everything to occur over our soil. Uh, I will give you this caveat with any cover crops that you're doing. They need to, to be planted soon enough. And by soon enough, I mean probably by the end of September to allow growth, some type of growth, before the soils freeze in November. So um, as they're growing rapidly, um, you leave them growing. Don't worry about any that might die. But then in springtime, if, you grow, if you're using something like winter rye, if that's a part of your mix, that's copious quantities of green material to dig in. You cut that down, cut, first cut down the rye before it reaches knee height, then go ahead and dig the roots into the soil. And especially with rye, it's very important that you wait two weeks and allow that material to really undergo decomposition before you plant seeds. If you don't give it that time of wait, what happens is, the roots of the rye give off compounds that prevent seed germination. Basically, they're saying, I'm the only person that belongs here. It's me first. 
And lots of plants do that. That's called allelopathy. So allow them to decompose. See what you can do. It's, it's not an instant fix. But what I found certainly in using buckwheat, a, um, a warm season crop, is that it has really changed the growing environment for tomatoes in this one community garden where I am growing for the community. So I think that everybody can look at cover crops, not just as winter, fall and winter cover crops, but look at them growing in aisles in your growing, during your growing season, right around your crops. And then when you're devising your garden plan for next year, you can say, ah, I grew cover crops in this part of the garden. This is where I'm going to do planting next year. So it's an instant way of helping you with crop rotation. The other thing that I would really encourage you to do would be to start taking pictures of your garden right now and make a plan. This is where this grew this year. And then work on crop rotation. Think about what you don't want to plant as much of next year, what you might want to plant more of. So start taking pictures, put it in your diary as far as this is what did well, this is what didn't do well. Uh, Judy, this is Lynn. When, yeah. when, do, you, when do you plant your, your garlic? Ah, good question. So we just had our fall plant sale and we were doing, we're still doing an online ordering. For those of you who don't have your garlic yet, you can get on the website and order garlic. But think of garlic. You froze. I lost Judy. Me too. <laughs> yep. she's, Same here. She's, she's frozen. Judy, come back. I don't even have an audio. I mean, a video. Oh, <laughs> okay. I don't know. Yep. Nope. That's, so I think it's on their end. Because <laughs> I didn't touch anything on my phone. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, so I where do you get those cover crop seeds like the rye? Well, I had trouble a couple of years ago and I ended up down at Tagawa in their, you know, pretty little 395. And that's where I got my rye and oak and, and it germinated, but it was sparse. And I mean, I put the whole bag, I have two plots at uh, Placebridge Academy and I, this is Lynn, and I um, put the whole, you know, and I watered and the whole thing and, you know, pampered it, put the alfalfa across the top and it was like, where's all my lush growth? Um, I had spots that were lush and everything and turned those in the spring, but I don't know. Um, I'm sure I did something wrong, but you know, yeah. um, I, I that's that's where, um, and I'm wondering if Mur Murdoch's would have it because it's a farm store, but I'm not sure. Oh, maybe, yeah. Hmm. Okay, I haven't tried it, so that's a good question. <laughs> I've been able to find pretty good sized bags of it at O'Toole's. Um, but something I learned this past year because it's about a pound or a two pound bag. Um, it doesn't germinate well the second year. So this year I'll make sure to use it up or give it to a friend, whatever isn't. Um, so that way I'm not keeping it the second year. Okay, yeah. where, where is the O'Toole's you go to? Um, that's the one in Littleton. Oh, okay, okay. All right, and, and they have it there now. Yes, or, yep, I've oh. seen it recently. It's in a purple bag. Okay. That visual helps. Thank you. 